Uh, thank you for invite inviting me to speak. I'm I'm not going to give you a whole range of pain diagnoses and stuff because that's actually a bit boring. You know, there's like neuropathic pain, which is no pain, or you've got chronic myofascial pain because that will come and go. What I'm interested in in exploring this and and this has been uh, focused by Nigel because you, know, you said you know yes we'd like to speak. I said great, just give me three hours. I can just touched the surface of the subject in three hours and he said no you've got 25 minutes now he said 20 minutes but i'm gonna take 25 so but what i'm interested in is why when when it doesn't seem obvious why a patient <coughs> is has pain and is disabled can we explain that you know is it all totally in dr master's field or actually can, have we still got insights into this and so um i'm going to explore some of those questions i'm going to touch on a few things now you've actually got i hope the handout of my slides. So please don't try and rush and write stuff down. It's no point because I will talk far too fast for that. And you, so you all have the references. So it's important just to pick up the major concepts because the details in one sense are really, really not important. Okay. So firstly, I'll sort of start with, um, so reflection on chronic pain experience, deceit, discrepancy, understanding the variable nature of human disability. And that's interesting, you know, because I've already started using another word. I started with pain and now I've got disability. And actually, I'm going to say to you, well, maybe maybe pain is not really the issue for us as pain consultants. And the diagnosis, does it actually matter? Well, of course, it does in a way because you've got the Judicial College guidelines and they have things like CRPS and nobody really understands. Well, I know certainly most of you won't understand what CRPS is, but it's actually a very real condition. We think it's an autoimmune condition, starts off by an injury, and it suddenly focuses the body's attention on one area and you get these really nasty the hand will suddenly go cold or the foot will go cold and you don't and that you know so the orthopedic says well there's nothing wrong with that but actually i can show by imaging there's something funny going on here and a lot of these do get better some don't 50 percent go on to have long-term symptoms and sometimes it's horrendous diagnosis but just because you get a crps and look at the bottom there a diagnosed crps doesn't define disability capacity work care and assistance and because the, and, and any diagnosis in pain does not define disability. They're very, very separate dimensions. That's really important to understand. You can have a diagnosis of myofascial pain. You can have a diagnosis of neuropathic pain. You can have a diagnosis of CRPS or chronic widespread pain. But the important thing is, what does it do to you? How are you with that diagnosis? And what determines it? And that's actually far more interesting. So... Um, just to go back to chronic pain syndrome, I'm not going to really talk about it because I have an expert colleague here who's very good into chronic pain disorders. The psychiatrists have been much better on chronic pain disorder and syndrome than we have, although we're going to now start getting in on act in the next ICD classification, international classification of disease. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. But that's because this time is limited. I'm not going to go into great detail. But suffice it to say, when the physical pain generators are few, and the psychological psychiatric factors are greater as well as the psychosocial factors then we'll start using the word chronic pain syndrome as a label and that's when we say yeah you talk to my colleague dr masters he'll help you out on that point so crps yes it's real it's not somatoform it's nothing to do with it. it's a real diagnosis but again and it's a very complicated disease process which we often get involved in like neuropathic pain and others but the important thing is don't don't think that that tells you how bad the patient is. Because the problem is when the patient looks online, you know what they'll say. Oh my goodness, I've got CRPS and I can't do anything. And actually that's not true. So I have pain, so what? The answer is that basically most people have pain. So if I said to you, how many of you at this moment are experiencing any pain in your body anywhere? Can you put your hands up? Okay, that's about say a third of you. That's actually quite low. Either you're lying, <laughs> which you probably are, because actually the incidence in the normal population generally runs at about 67 70% have some pain. But we're not all disabled. So when you see the figures here of, of epidemiology, actually most of us are likely to have some pain somewhere. And in a lifetime, most people experience a much very severe episode, particularly back then, 85% chance. But most people have pain and they're not disabled. Because you're all here this evening, okay? And that tells us that. And that's quite important. Pain and disability are not the same thing. Even very, very sporty people who do other things, like go to get chosen for going into war and things, actually, they start off with low pain incidences, say 
when you go and join the military, but by the time you have spent a year in the army, the incidence is 77%, just by normal wearing loads, everything like that. So we know that actually the human body experiences pain, but we get on with it most of the time. So pain, physical impairment and disability are not the same thing. And actually the job of pain consultants actually is to really find out whether that pain matters. Because for most of us it doesn't matter, but some people it does. And then you say, how do you connect the dot? How do you say there's objective physical impairment like orthopedics, there's pain experience, but how disabled are they? And you can have two people with very similar levels of pain, physical pain generator and physical impairment, but have massively different disabilities. So. If somebody is disabled, is this a disability likely to be static? The answer is no. Even normal people have good and bad days. It's not just people undergoing court cases. So this is actually a very simple test. How quickly can you feed a load of beads onto a, onto a, onto a little pole? And you do that, right? And what you can show is that people with pain of some sort, this was a rheumatoid arthritis, you, depending on the time of day you do it, there's a massive variation in response, you know, from 55 seconds up to 65 seconds, so 20% variation roughly. But these are control subjects. So even at 5%, they've got about 10% variation. So that's actually quite important. If you look at other, other sorts of conditions, this is something fibromyalgia syndrome, which I went, there's a widespread pain. It's even more dramatic, particularly when you get to looking at things like fatigue. Look at this, from 90 to 110. I said that it doesn't really matter what it's measuring, but look at the variation. You're talking about 20% variation in performance. That's really quite important. So when I say to people, tell me about your pain, I want to know good and bad days, because this may, ma may matter when you come to surveillance and we're talking about credibility. Because 20%, if you take a, what we in pain consider a good treatment, it's a 30% reduction. So here we're saying, endogenously, constitutionally, you may have 20% variation in your function. And we think 30% is actually a, a significant change. So you're very close to getting massive changes simply because this is day-to-day -day life. There are you know, lots of reasons for this. Uh, I always think that it always dips at around this point because I haven't had enough coffee, you know, and, and you, people feeling a bit low around about lunchtime. So, um, so that's another thing. So pain, and so it's not just how much pain they're experiencing. I mean, I had somebody on Tuesday said, I've got terrible pain. It's like I want to chop my hand off and it's so bad I can't do anything. And I said, and so when did this, oh, two years ago because he had this thing. Uh, and then I said, so can you show me some, have you got any pictures of what your hand was like then? Oh, yes. And he gets his phone out. So the hand that he feels like chopping off and he can't use, he then starts tapping his phone with to show me the pictures of how bad his hand was then and how terrible it is now. Now, do you see the disconnect? And that is the sort of thing we need to work on. So, this immediately is, an, is the pain <coughs> organic? Somebody said, yeah, is it organic or psychological? Well, the answer is, we all have physical pain generally. Pain is part of our system. We need pain. Because if you don't have it, you get the, all these nasty burns, and you see people around the country. Yeah. So we need pain. But when the disability becomes disproportionate, then you start worrying. And then you say, right, what are, what are the factors involved? And usually, if, you're, if you have a case that's valuable enough to instruct me, because I'm very expensive, then you must also be instructing a psychiatrist. That's my bottom line, okay? You've got to get the both in together, because if, 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 if chronic pain always has a, a psychological psychiatric component. My own preference is for psychiatrists, because these patients need treatment. They need treatment not only with psychological therapy, they also need treatment with drugs, often. So you've got to have a doctor who knows what the response to the drugs is going to be, if you're going to look at prognosis. Is it helpful to attempt to make the distinction between organic and psychological? The answer is yes, because the treatment of the physical aspects, we say the sticking, stimulated, do injection, is very different from the psychological aspects. You do not treat a psychological problem with a needle, unless you're sticking the needle in the brain. Okay. So what I'm saying is that it's important to at least separate out, tease out the different components. How much is physical? How much is psychological? How much is psychosocial? How much actually appears in the presence of the significant other? Because some people are much more disabled in the presence of their partner and spouse who's been looking after them. And those are the aspects that when we start talking about patients. So Mayer, in 1860, this is a recent quote, 1866, psychosocial factors influence the course and outcome of every illness, even more so in pain. And Job, even a slightly older quote of 2,000 years BC, for the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. And what it means by that is that once you start having gone through an episode of pain and you are 
and it's intensely painful because you've had an accident, you've crushed your hand, you've had a whiplash, you stop doing things that might reproduce that pain. Okay? So you, you become fearful. That's the fear. Fear avoidant. But what happens when the underlying pain gets better? Do you, do you, do you start doing things again? Some people don't. Which people don't? The ones who are usually very anxious because they've got a heightened sense of vulnerability. Anxiety, depression, PTSD, those are the patients who will stop doing stuff and need to be encouraged to start again. Okay? So they develop fear avoidant behavior. And this is a specific. Now, fear avoidant behavior is not a psychiatric diagnosis. It's a, it's, it's a socio and a pain behavioral diagnosis. So it's stuff that we deal with because you have to do a physical assessment as well. So it's, you can have this, but you don't have to have depression and PTSD as such. But the important thing is that they often coexist. So can we measure fear of movement? No exact uh, numbers. It's a very, it's a new, relatively new understanding. And I said, you, I won't go into all the details, but basically it's apprehension. I won't do this because it caused me pain. And so you have to encourage them. Functional rehabilitation. Uh, you give them a, a cognitive behavioral therapy. You can even do scales. It's called a Tampa scale because it's it, Tampa, Florida. And this is a sort of scale that we sometimes use in fear of movement and assessing it. So it's done by physical people like pain consultants and physiotherapists. And then but there are psychological aspects to it, so it's a mixed picture. We know depression will worsen pain, and I won't go into details, but that's to show you depression makes pain worse, pain makes depression worse. Nasty combination, you know, there's an inter interplay between the two. The, the paper here about PTSD is interesting because this was done in veterans, and basically they had, a lot of them had pain. And do you know what they did? They ignored the pain, they just treated the PTSD, and guess what happened to the pain? It improved. Because if you've got PTSD, you're hypervigilant. You, you're, you're aware of everything. Everything's like, oh my goodness, you've seen some PTSD patients and I see a lot. They, they focus on all the pains around their body. If you can get the PTSD right down, their experience of pain drops and the disability drops spontaneously. So the first thing I do with PTSD patients is say, let's treat your PTSD and worry about whatever pains you have left at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Patients in pain who have psychological problems focus on them. They selectively attend to pain-related information. They focus on the bad. That means when you ask them how much they can do, guess what? They say, I can do nothing. Well, actually, you know they can do stuff. Does that mean they're malingering? No, because their brain thinks they can't do it. So it's important to actually assess this. Really important because it comes up time and time again when, when the defense will say, oh, they're making it up because they can do this. Actually, a lot of them genuinely do believe that they cannot do stuff. And when they're stressed, they can't. And when they're less stressed, they can. Pain-related fear, and this is where it all came to, the fear, pain-related fear is more disabling the pain itself. You had a pain, but now you got over the initial pain, the whiplash, the crush injury, da-da-da, but you're so fearful, you never really get back to the era because you're so, you know, it's like some, you were trapped in prison with the pain, and now the door is opened, but you're afraid to come out again. And so you have to encourage them and help them. Some people will come out, but if you're, if you're a psych psychologically damaged individual, pre-existing or as a consequence of the accident, you will have problems in this area. Vulnerability. So it leads us on to vulnerability. Claimants with pain experience often a history of presenting with unexplained physical problems, which will Dinshaw will cover. It's possible. Is it possible to have with any confidence what level of disability such claims would have had absent the accident? So this is one of Nigel's things. Yeah, yeah, spend 30 seconds just telling us about that. Of course, this is a very important field. And the answer is we have actually a bit of data. We know to look for things. Did you know that I can tell you how long you're going to be off after whiplash by just asking you how much time did you have off from work in the last five years? Don't, don't care what it's about, nothing. If you were employed, how much time do you have work? That is a very powerful predictive uh, factor for how badly you are going to do or how well you're going to do after a whiplash injury. Isn't that amazing? So you can see the vulnerability there. So, and this bit, so sick leave before the collision strongly predict a prolonged recovery from the whiplash. As I said, you can read all the rest of it later. So, when we come to road traffic accidents, we're not talking about the major road traffic accidents, where you think, oh my goodness, you know, there's an arm like this and the leg wobbling off to one side. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the relatively modest minor one, and people seem awfully disabled. 2,000 patients free of chronic widespread pain for four years, so they were stable people. Six physically traumatic events were looked at. RTAs, workplace injury, surgery, fracture, and hospitalization, and childbirth. That's, kind of, that's considered traumatic events. Quite interesting, isn't it? Childbirth. So what you do then is you follow them up and see what happens. And what you find is you can show that the onset of chronic widespread pain seems to be related 
to a traumatic event, particularly RTAs. So that's basically saying there's an increased risk of developing chronic widespread pain with RTA. Yeah, of course. The RTA is the cause of it. Now, we're talking about these very modest injuries. We're not talking about major crashes. We're talking about modest injuries. But then you start looking at the pre-existing factors, like psychological distress pre-existing, anxiety, depression, adverse health behavior, sleep problems pre-existing. And you control for those. So you say, let's put those in the equation. And do you know what you find? For these modest RTAs, you can totally predict which ones are going to get chronic widespread pain after an accident, but it doesn't matter about the accident. The accident determined the timing, but the prediction of whether they were going to get it was all due to these pre-existing factors. Does that make sense? It's very, very important. What it's saying is the accident was a trigger for something that was impending here already. How do I know it's impending and not just latent? Because in the control group, 10 to 15% over those four years developed chronic widespread pain with no trauma. That's one study. The next study. This is basically talking about what, uh, what happened, and you could show that the accident's got very little to do with it. I'll, and this is talking about the incident of chronic widespread pain in Manchester, it's about 5%, and I'm not going to go into this one, actually. But look at this other study. These are people who are just psychologically vulnerable, and they develop chronic widespread pain in the absence of any trauma. Ten, over 15, in this study, over 15 months, 10% did. So look at your patient. Look at the vulnerability. So we can start, we've got statistics there. Will this patient developing disabling low back pain? Okay. Let's look at the factors he found in this study. Health status, psychiatric comorbidity, seem to be risk factors. So this in two means doubling, okay? But look at this. Prior history, you know I said how people have low back pain, all of us have it, a bit of it. And it comes, you know, it will come and go, and again, that's the epidemiology. Is that a risk factor? Actually, if you've got that non-intrusive low back pain, which is that most people have, like most of the ones who put your hands up here, the answer is no, it's not a risk factor. So, uh, mildly intrusive back pain is not a risk factor, but other factors are. But, interestingly, what about the diagnosis of the type of low back pain? Nope, doesn't matter. Types of injury? Nope, doesn't matter. Response to injection therapies that I so, you know, love? Nope, doesn't matter. Facet joints, all these things you hear about. Nope, doesn't matter. Controversially, one could say, sorry, it seems to have disappeared off the side, you don't need any biological factors in to be considered in the biopsychosocial model of chronic pain. That's one interpretation. The biological aspect is really small. It's there, it triggered, but after that, it disappears. What other factors help you predict about pain? And what you can show is that there are different types of pain, uh, non-chronic recurrent, chronic regional pain, chronic, sorry, chronic widespread pain. Each of those, apart from the first, is a risk factor for the other. So you can say, if you had any of these before, you're more likely than not to get stuff. You can also show, you say, patients, are you, tell me you've had this injury, what do you think is going to happen to you? And do you know what they think is going to happen to them actually happens to them? That which I feared has come upon me. And what you can show is expectations show will actually prove in practice. In fact, what the person, the patient, the client thinks is going to happen to them in the first literally three weeks will determine outcome. Very powerful predictive strength. That's what the meaning on the side is. Ask your patient or client what do they think is going to happen and it will come over again in another bit. I'm going to skip over this one because of time. When you put all that sort of data that we have now together as pain consultants, we can actually start saying, yes, we can help you predict what's going to happen absent the index event and also the vulnerability and consequence of the index event. That's it. This is a very complicated slide. What you have here is anxiety and depression at uh, the bottom. Okay, so you've got here no moderate or higher risk anxiety and depression. You see, that's one table. What it talks about comorbid conditions is other factors, including migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, asthma, any musculoskeletal problems, so any other medical problems. And you can show, absent any trauma, the chances of getting chronic pain rise in a lifetime, such that if you've got high anxiety and depression and at least two major other illnesses, you are more likely than not to get chronic pain in your lifetime. So again, these are predictive factors. They also act as vulnerability, so it's a little more nuanced than that, but I'm just giving you the basic that we are actually in a pretty good position now to understand who is vulnerable to chronic pain in a lifetime. Disability. Should pain uh, impact upon someone's ability to work? Da, da, da. And does a provision of care help hinder? I can't answer all these questions, but I'm going to focus on one or two issues. What determines return to work following acute low back pain? And the answer is the strong evidence that shows this is return to work. 
Firstly, as I mentioned, this is from this is from uh, some data produced by uh, I think this is the Canadian government. Uh, workers' recovery expectation, their prediction about how likely is they will return to work before they're able to return. Basically, they say they're going to go back to work, they're going to go back to work. Interaction with healthcare providers, self-reported pain and limitation, what they say themselves, not the objective findings of a doctor, but what they say they feel, and work-related factors. Indeed, and I'm going to skip through it, this is a paper by Sade, S-C-H-A-D-E. I'm sorry, I don't think I've seen it with the rest of it, in, but you've got a reference. If you look at whether a massive disprolapse determined whether you were going to go back to work, or how badly or well the surgery went, or how much neuropathic pain decided how much you were going back to work, do you know what really made all the difference about whether you were going to go back to work or not? Whether you enjoyed your job before you had the accident. That is the most major factor whether you're going to return to work. So look at that as part of the overall thing. And this is very similar, this other one here. So psychosocial factors, and I won't go into details, basically de social decline happens and it, it encourages and contributes to the disability and indeed the perception of pain. So as pain not, we have to say, actually, are there physical factors we need to treat? Is there a whiplash? Is there a joint we need to inject? Or are there factors now getting involved and we need to gently pass them over to Dr. Masters to help? OK, so that's that's our role in this factor. Secondary gain issues, you know about, but I'm not going to go into great details at the moment, but they are a factor. And what I'm going to talk about, does surveillance help? Yes, it does, because there's a massive discrepancy. It makes a difference. But I've told you about good and bad days and how good and how bad even ordinary people have. So I'm not, don't just just because there's a slight variation is no, of no interest to me. If it's a massive difference, like I've got a paralyzed arm and then he's they're seen playing darts. And of course, I might be a little more cynical. But little, you know, good and bad days, particularly stressful, non-stressful situations, you have to accept this is part of daily existence and life. Symptom magnification. The important thing is it's easier to pick up people who are totally naive trying to simulate injury than those who are slightly exaggerating. We've seen this in all our cases because once you've been through a painful experience, you can easily mimic that. You can remember it. And in a sense, that is part of the psychology of why people are, have chronic pain. So it is far more difficult. I won't go through malingering, I'm going to leave that. Um, we, as doctors, don't like talking about malingering, but the courts need guidance, so I think you need to encourage your experts to talk about it. And, of course, complaints grossly in excess of clinical findings, bizarre, absurd, inconsistent symptoms, these are the sort of things that obviously do make us think, and I won't go through details because you know that. But certainly getting your experts to focus on it is really important. One of the reasons I do video at the time of my examination is to say, here's some video of how they presented when the surveillance comes along in these big cases, as it all we can just compare, see if it's good. And sometimes it's actually very helpful to the client, and sometimes it's absolutely damning. So it can work both ways. Why may there be a discrepancy in they're not malingering? Fear avoidance, catastrophizing. I talked about fear avoidance, you know, being somatization will lead to Dinshaw, depressed, anxiety. And these vary day to day in mood. And you can talk about as you get older, we know that you become very much more difficult. You can do certain activities, then you have to stop. So they can do a burst of activity, and then your capacity to do any more just drops away. You can lift once, but you can't lift 10 times like you did previously. So lots of factors to consider. Is malingering common? That's an interesting question. So orthopedic surgeon said 5%, and I said I won't go into details for patients. All right. 5% live it in sweet. That's a classic paper, malingering. However, when you then start looking at um, the cognitive performance tests, what they found was underperformance in the context of litigation, again, I won't go into it, 61% compared to 29% in the outpatient clinic. So this was much, much higher. And both sets of record data, won't get it. Now, this is an interesting one. Naive people faking is probably easier to spot than symptom exaggeration. I've already said that. I said I'm going to whiz through this because I've come to the end of my time. But I'm going to talk to you another study. This was a study looking at fibromyalgia patients. And what they did is that they gave them a test of because, you know, fibromyalgia can get cognitive dysfunction. So they gave people who were not in the medical legal context ordinary, volunteers this test on cognitive function. And it looks difficult, but actually it's a dead easy test. And they gave people who were brain injured. OK, and so the brain injured people, really properly brain injured people are doing and scoring an average of 96 percent correct on this test. So we know it was actually a very simple test. OK, and of course, people like who are, who are sort of healthy controls, 97%. So that's pretty good. You gave it to fibromyalgia patients applying for benefits and 20 to 40% failed the test. 
So that gives you an idea of the stress, the financial secondary gain issues that might, that sort of percentage. And I, I always say to people, I estimate, who knows, I estimate about a third of my patients are significantly impaired due to the medical legal process itself. And that would fit with that figure. That means two thirds are. So let's look on the positive. But one third are. I think he would say more, wouldn't you? <laughs> So prevalence of lingering chronic pain, pain, and So basically, twenty and fifty percent is another study. I was just going to get because it's actually very rare this sort of pay, these sort of work. But it's thirty percent. I think is a very reasonable figure to work on. And I'm going to uh, live the, leave this one out because it, I haven't got around. So and the priming of medical expert. This is very naughty of you, particularly defendants who say we think this and this and this, and we want you to examine. Do not prime your expert. It really doesn't help us. Okay. You can give a range of opinions, so it's much better to let them come up with their own opinion in these matters, and that's what it's um, negative. This is negative evaluation, and particularly things like pain, because in a sense you have to listen to the patient. Often there are very few physical signs. If you want to hang on to the surveillance and send us a patient, then throw us the surveillance afterwards and say, "There, you're wrong. You see, you know, you got it all wrong." Then fine, but really don't prime them. How reliable is patient reporting? Well, I did talk about the fact that you have variability in performance, and I did say that depressed and pain patient depressed patients focus on their pain and they focus on their disability. And it's really important to tease that out so that you're not accused of malingering later. Okay, this is the same paper. Do patients with chronic pain selectively attend to pain-related information? The answer is yes, they do, and they develop fear of movement. They become hypervigilant. They stop going to areas, apart from when they're not stressed, and then suddenly they may relax a bit and do a bit more. And that's, of course, inevitably they get caught out by the surveillance at that point. But if you ask them to think about their daily life, most of the time they are disabled. Okay, the Waddell test, I don't think I've got time to go over this. I'm going to leave all this. And I'm going to leave the disability medicine. So, remember pain is a form of communication. If you've got a significant other in the room who's looking after this disabled patient and she's given up her life or he's given up his life to do so, they're not going to get better easily. We know this is a big problem. And when they do get better, often the, the carer is very angry about it. And this is, and I've seen, we've had patients who basically we've cured, okay? Guess what happens? The relationship splits up. Because I spent five years looking after you, bloody well had these, and why didn't you have these five years ago? You know, da, da, da. So you think they'd be pleased, but they're not because they've lost their role. So it's really important to look at the social interaction. What about employment? The interesting thing is, if you go if you come out of the medico-legal process not working, the chance of you working afterwards is very, very, very small indeed. If you, if you are working at the end of the medico-legal process, the chance of you working are very, are very high. So that means if you're in the process and you're still working, get them back to work. I know people say, oh, delay treatment to the end, and that's what Dr. Masters will probably tell you. My feeling is that you do, yes, it may not be as effective to do the treatment now, but start it sooner and then complete it on the end. Because we know that if you treat early, you're more likely to get a response. And as time goes on uh, uh, from the injury, the response to any therapy drops away dramatically. I have run out of time, so thank you very much for listening.